Picard arrived at the Pacific Theater of War in the autumn of 1943, when the battles for Bougainville Island at New Guinea were in full swing. The Allies were pushing the Japanese forces back, seeking to approach the Philippines. In turn, the Japanese were trying to provide their garrisons with necessary supplies and send transport convoys to the besieged islands. This is the Mark 40, 5-inch, 25 duck gun, common to U.S. submarines in World War II. These were very desired by the captains by the end of the war. Early on, they had a 4-inch gun, which was not as effective, very difficult to work with. These were a great upgrade because towards the end of the war, we had smaller ships and these subs actually became gunboats, which meant they came to the surface to use their deck guns rather than torpedoes. The nice thing about the five inch gun was you didn't have to wait for everything to get drained out. You just load the shells and start to shoot. Artillery armament, Mark 40 gun mount, Caliber, 127 mm, range, 13,000 meters, rate of fire, up to 20 shots per minute. Two 40 mm Bofors anti-aircraft guns, Browning M2 machine gun, caliber 12.7 mm. The American fleet submarine carries at least 200 rounds of main caliber ammunition and 400 rounds of 40 mm and uh, thousands of rounds of 50 caliber uh, machine gun ammunition. So they're floating arsenals. No matter how strong a submarine's armament, this alone isn't enough to result in a successful operation. It's important to have all the necessary means to detect your enemy on board, and these should be as diverse as the sub's armament. We're here in the conning tower of the COD. It's a pressure vessel above the main pressure hull. It's eight feet in diameter, 17 feet long. This is where the uh, officers and the approach party would conduct attacks. Uh, up to 11 men would be crammed in this small space during a submerged attack. It holds for us the radars, the sonar, the torpedo data computer, as well as our main steering and the two periscopes. The American TDC, or Torpedo Data Computer, of World War II was a marvel of engineering. It used spherical cams to solve spherical trigonometry equations in real time. No microchips or microprocessors involved. Firing torpedoes while submerged presents quite a complex problem involving multiple variables. Imagine that you need to hit a swinging log with a billiard cue. While standing on roller skates at a distance of 30 meters, you're allowed to look at your target only two or three times with one eye. To solve this issue and to make firing torpedoes easier, different countries developed computing instruments. In World War II, the United States achieved the most significant progress in this area. American machine here, the TDC, uh, takes time out of the equation. So the minute you have the correct solution light, if your data is good, the torpedoes will meet the target uh, uh, in time and space. So the Germans and the Japanese and the British, their machines are saying, shoot now. If you shoot too soon or wait too long, your torpedo is gonna miss. In terms of its construction, the Mark IV TDC consisted of three blocks that were connected electromechanically. Data was input both in manual and automatic modes. The receiver would automatically read data about the submarine's course and speed from the gyro compass and dynamic pressure log. Crew members would input information about the target's course, speed, and range, obtained with the help of the periscope, sonar, and radar. It was adjusted every 15 to 20 minutes. The TDC would calculate the target's position and automatically automatically send all the data necessary for firing to a gyroscope installed inside the torpedo launcher. This way, the torpedo was able to hit its target, regardless of the submarine's position. The computer made it possible to continuously predict a target's position, even when the submarine was maneuvering and fire at night or under conditions of limited visibility. Uh, we're going to turn this on and start integrating some data. And what you're hearing is uh, a 1944 computer turning on and uh, accepting the data we've preset in the machine. If we estimate the target's course and speed, we can wait five minutes. We're gonna bring the scope up. If we see the target in our crosshairs, we know our data is correct. 
If the target hasn't arrived yet or has passed the periscope uh, view, uh, we know our data is uh, in need of uh, refinement. Either he's going faster or slower. And now let's start firing fish that we have the correct solution. We have our two firing boxes right here with the actual firing buttons for the forward tubes and the after tubes. Captain will say, standby two, so we'll turn tube two to standby. The spindles engage light comes on. This tells us that the mechanical programmer is now communicating with the torpedo while it's in the tube. When the proper gyro angle is set, the spindles will come out and this light will go off and this light will come on telling us that tube two is ready to fire. So I will wait for the captain to say fire two. When we hear that command fire two, I'll push that button and we'll wait. And the TDC has told us what the runtime is. So we're gonna wait. Uh, we'll, we might have our stopwatch to uh, track the time and hopefully we're gonna hear big explosions and we're gonna bring the scope up and see hopefully the ship going down. More sophisticated means of detection and torpedo fire control combined with their enemy's weak anti-submarine defenses paid off. During the Pacific War, American submarines sank about 75% of the Japanese merchant fleet. The price they paid for it was a mere 17% of their submarines lost. This means that every fifth sub didn't return to port. Compare this to the losses suffered by German U-boats during the Battle of the Atlantic. 75% of them were destroyed, while managing to sink only 1% of the Allied merchant fleet. The Gato class subs uh, were uh, um, in the thick of the fight early on, again, being the, uh, the largest and most capable boats at the time, uh, were given the, uh, the, the most difficult missions. Uh, on May 10th, 1944, the COD is involved in her largest uh, combat. Uh, she is the last submarine uh, that's able to attack a 35-ship convoy coming to reinforce the Japanese garrison in Manila. Throughout the night, the sub pursued the convoy, trying to pass its anti-submarine defense ships undetected. At dawn, she finally managed to break through the outer ring and into the core of convoy where she launched all six torpedoes from her bow tubes at the cargo vessels. The sonar man hears some high-speed screws behind us. The captain turns his periscope aft and sees the Japanese destroyer Harukaya just 300 yards behind us, cutting across our stern, and he flips the periscope into high magnification and realizes there are crewmen on the bridge pointing at his periscope. And uh, so he quickly fires three torpedoes from the stern tubes. Two of them catch the Karukaya in amidships and break it in half. But it was too early to celebrate victory. A Japanese hydroplane dropped a smoke boy right next to their periscope, and the sub had to submerge. The boat headed away from the attack area at maximum speed. We uh, clear the area very quickly, but uh, the firing point is saturated with 100 depth charges within a few minutes. Uh, they're going off like strings of firecrackers. The ships are so close to the harbor that they're able to proceed into the harbor safely and all of the escort destroyers come out to kill the COD. COD's captain reduced speed to a noiseless level, two to three knots, and managed to evade sonar detection. 
All day the boat maneuvered, turning its bow or aft towards enemy sonar signals so as to present as small a target as possible for them. Toward evening, uh, with the batteries running very low, the sonar man hears water hitting the surface of the ocean a few miles away, and the captain says, maybe that's a rain squall, so head toward that sound, and he puts the periscope up and realizes it's a heavy rainstorm, so cod surfaces in the rainstorm and gets out of the area very quickly. So that's uh, a typical attack for an American submarine. The glorious Gato-class submarines, including USS Cod, arguably became the most famous American submarines of the World War II era. USS Flasher was one of the most successful US submarines, with more than 100,000 sunk tonnage credited to her. USS Kavala sank Japanese aircraft carrier Shukaku, which had participated in the attack on Pearl Harbor. USS Wahoo single-handedly destroyed an entire convoy of four ships off the coast of New Guinea. In 1943, she became one of the first US submarines to break through to the Sea of Japan. USS Finback recovered a downed pilot, George H.W. Bush, future President of the United States. USS Barb landed a team from her crew on the Japanese-held southern shore of Sakhalin Island. They placed charges under a railroad track and blew up a passing train. Later in the war, uh, we uh, were sent on a junk mission because the Japanese targets were getting fewer and far between. Uh, and COD was based in the, uh, in the uh, Southwest Pacific. So we were based out of Australia, uh, and our mission was to interdict the Japanese shipping coming out of the South China Sea, the rubber, tin, and oil coming from Malaysia and uh, some, of the, uh, some of the areas around uh, the Philippines. We participated in a campaign to prevent the Philippines from being reinforced. Uh, before our reinvasion or liberation of the, ja uh, the Philippines. Um, so late in the war, uh, the last patrol, we sank about 26 junks. Uh, but we're also very proud of the fact that on our final last war patrol, while we're sinking the junks, we were sent to rescue the crew of the Dutch submarine O-19. The Dutch had a very small but very uh, effective force of submarines fighting with the Allies. Sadly, the Dutch sub 019 ran up on a coral reef in the middle of the night, and the Cod, unable to free her, uh, had to take the 55 Dutch crewmen aboard for three days, destroy the Dutch submarine, and uh, put them ashore in the Philippines, which had just been liberated. Um, the Cod uh, returned to her home base at the end of the month, the Dutch were waiting for the COD crew and they uh, said, tomorrow night we have a thank you party for saving our lives. Well, the next night at the thank you party, they find out the war is over. So it became one heck of a party. Which is why today COD's battle flag carries a martini glass over the name 019 to commemorate history's only international sub to sub rescue and that infamous party. On the last day of summer in 1945, COD set a course for home. After an overhaul, the submarine was sent to the reserve, but in 1951, she was recommissioned. COD served in the Caribbean and around South America for the next three years. Then she was finally decommissioned once and for all, and in 1971 was stricken from the Naval Register. Five years later, residents of Cleveland, not indifferent to the submarine's faithful service, took care of her and turned her into a museum. In 1986, USS COD became a national historic landmark.
We're very proud of the COD because it is very representative of the American fleet submarine of World War II. She's the only World War II submarine to retain both its hull integrity and its World War II configuration. She uh, remained pretty much intact. We were able to add the deck guns that were missing and a lot of the uh, crew habitation aspects. So when people visit the COD, uh, they're going to uh, take a, a trip back in time uh, to see what we believe is perhaps the best uh, restored fleet submarine.